Welcome back to Face the Nation and more of Robert Costa's conversation with former Vice President Mike Pence. There has been a spate of gun violence in recent weeks, and it's at times legal gun owners shooting people who come up to their door on a driveway in a parking lot. What is happening in America, and can anything be done to dial down the fear and the violence? Well, our, our hearts go out to the families of lost loved ones in the incidents in, in Kansas City and in upstate New York. I just can't imagine uh, the pain that they're enduring and that tragedy. But uh, tragedy should not require us to forfeit our liberty. Uh, and the right of law-abiding citizens to keep and bear arms is enshrined in the Constitution of the United States. Uh, I, I don't know the facts of those cases. I'm confident that local law enforcement will move forward and apply the law in a proper way. But I can't help but suspect that this recent spate of tragedies is evidence of the fear that so many Americans are feeling about the crime wave besetting this country. But I think most people would agree, even if you have fear about crime in your community, there's no excuse to be just shooting at somebody at your door or in, your, in a parking lot. I, I can't imagine the circumstances that I read about in the press in either of those cases. And, and, and I'm, I'm sure local law enforcement will hold people to a proper accounting. I, uh, but I, but at, at the end of the day, I, I just wonder, I wonder if it isn't some reflection of the fear the American people feel about the crime wave that's impacting uh, our country, literally from coast to coast. You have agreed to appear before the special counsel's ongoing grand jury investigating January 6th with some constraints on your testimony. Have you set a date with the special counsel about your appearance? Well, our, our attorneys have worked that out with the Justice Department. And I, but I will say, I, I, I'm grateful that the court recognized that there are specific constitutional protections unique to the vice president when you're serving in your role as president of the Senate. I thought it was important to make that challenge for the first time in history. A federal court acknowledged that that provision of the Constitution applies to the vice president, and they've they've limited what they'll be requesting of me. But we'll, uh, Help us beyond understand that, that, I can tell you, bit. Robert, we'll we'll obey the law. Uh, we'll tell the truth, and uh, the story that I've been telling the American people all across the country, the story that I wrote in the pages of my memoir, that'll uh, that'll be what I tell in that setting as well. But for a layperson who's not a lawyer, what are the constraints in your view on your upcoming testimony. Will you, for example, be able to testify in your view about the private conversations you have had with President Trump? Is that within the range of what you could do before the grand jury? I think I'm limited about what I can say about the proceedings of the grand jury or the decision of the judge, but people can be confident that we'll, uh, we'll obey the law, we'll comply with the law. But I got to tell you, Robert, uh, nobody's talking to me about this. Fox News just settled with Dominion for $787 million over false claims that were on the network. Any reaction? Well, I, I would assume that, that Fox News determined uh, what, what the appropriate settlement was and what the exposure was in that case. I can't, I can't really speak to it. That was not a time in my life that I was watching a lot of television, Robert. I was focused on the tax at hand, focused on doing our duty under the Constitution of the United States. The role that you, your network, and other members of the media play is vital uh, to our democracy. And uh, I'll always stand for a free and independent press, even when I don't agree with what you say or do. It's almost May. When are you going to decide <laughs> on whether you are running for the Republican nomination? Well, we're getting awful close, but I don't have anything to announce today, Robert, but I Will I you promise, make a hard decision by late June? I think anyone that would be serious about seeking the Republican nomination uh, would need to be in this contest uh, by June. And, so you uh, will make a decision by late June? I, I think if, if we have an announcement to make, uh, whether it'll but, be well before late June. But are you leaning in or are you leaning away from running? Well, I'm here in Iowa, Robert. <laughs> well, that's a tell. Look, I love this country. And I think America's in a lot of trouble. And what I hear people telling me is that the challenges that we're facing 
in an increasingly dangerous world. Uh, the challenges that we're facing in this economy with uh, inflation at a 40-year high, a crisis at our border, um, are, are going to require someone who has the ability to step in on day one and set our country back on a path towards security and prosperity. And uh, so we're thinking very deeply about that. And as I said, I, sounds like I don't have anything in. to announce sounds today. Sounds like you're leaning but in. I, uh, look, leaning uh, toward it versus away. I, I would tell you that I'm very humbled by the encouragement that we're receiving, and uh, uh, I promise when we have something to announce, you'll be among the first to know. Robert Krause's full conversation with the former vice president is on our website and our Face the Nation YouTube channel. We'll be right back. We go now to the mayor of Kansas City, which is where the shooting of Ralph Yarl happened. Quentin Lucas joins us now from our affiliate KCTV. Good morning to you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this case is Good morning. is so tragic, um, and it has really captured the attention of the country. Uh, the shooter was 84 years old, and he shot unarmed 16-year-old for ringing his doorbell. Um, he says he thought he was about to be robbed. I know you already have a high rate of gun violence in Kansas City, but what is this particular tragedy meant? Well, to me, it says several things. And one of those was mentioned just a moment ago by Vice President Pence in the interview. I think that actually it is this culture of fear and paranoia that's drummed up by some, including politicians like the former vice president, who mention it almost in a way as if it's an excuse for this type of action. This was in the safest neighborhood of Kansas City, or one of our safest neighborhoods, and this was a man who in his statement to the police said, I was scared of this, in essence, large black person outside of his door. He thought the child was six feet tall, he was only 5'8". He thought he was a threat, he was on the other side of two locked doors. This is the sort of thing that happens when you have this culture of paranoia and fear that's being drummed up by politicians and some in the media. And of course, this fetishization, I've said before, of guns. More stand your ground laws, more laws that say you should use your gun and have it absolutely everywhere. So your governor, um, who is a Republican, condemned the shooting. Uh, very clearly, but he also said that President Biden was politicizing it by calling the family of that boy, Ralph Yarl. Um, he didn't call the families of the victims in New York and in Texas. What do you make of that? And does it complicate things when the president gets involved, just given how divided our country is right now? It absolutely does not complicate anything when the president gets involved. First of all, this was a, a news story, an incident, a situation that had the attention of the country long before President Biden called and actually did the just humane thing and gave best wishes to a boy who had just been shot twice. This is a 16-year-old in the Midwest who'd been shot twice. He gets a call from the president of the United States, which I think is a nice thing. But really, if you think about all the conversation, there was not a conversation I had certainly in this city, but with any mayors around the country who weren't noticing this story. The racial dynamic, the fact that these laws that are extreme are frankly arming our citizens and having them more scared, I think, than they've ever been before. This was an 84-year-old man who went to sleep in one of the safest neighborhoods of Kansas City, but still had a loaded gun. And when he heard a disturbance at his door, the first thing he thought to do wasn't just to brandish. It wasn't even to say a word or scream at somebody who would be outside. It was to shoot, and to shoot twice. The facts of this case were astonishing in and of themselves, and had the president never said a word, there would still be lots of attention. I strongly disagree with the governor, particularly when his party often has politicized mm -hmm. any number of incidents relating to border crossings and beyond in places like Missouri, far away from our southern border, to use any number of political examples. I think that this is a serious situation, and the real politicization are the people who, after each one of these incidents, yeah. say, oh, let's blame it on mental health, let's blame it on society. It's, it's tragic right now. You uh, just talked about your Republican governor, um, and I just want to point out that in Kansas City, it's a little bit unusual because you, as mayor, don't oversee the police department. There's a board appointed by the state uh, that oversees them. So you're a Democrat yeah. in a red state where you can't control the police department in your own city. So how do you work with the governor to crack down on the gun violence if it is the Republicans in control of it? 
Well, we beg, we pray, and we plead with them. These, these are Missourians who are, are shot, right? This is not some sort of thing where the city is just an evil place far, far away. We are within this state. But you're seeing not just in Missouri. We've had this set up for a while in Kansas City. Right now, there's an effort to take over state control of policing in St. Louis. You saw a lawsuit filed by the NAACP on Friday night in Jackson, Mississippi, mm -hmm. relating to that issue where there's this state takeover. The cities are now punching bags. They have been for a while, but you're seeing this new extreme of everything that happens here, even our crime isn't something that we need to fix for the state instead it's an indictment let's say on, on the city people themselves I think it has lots to do with racial differences that are present in the city our different views on gun crimes and frankly it's something that can scare people a little bit more yeah. than perhaps talking about international affairs or deficits instead it's something that seems to be down the street and it is harming and tearing apart our country um, a lawyer for Ralph Yarl's family spoke to my colleague Gail King and said they were pleased with the felony charges that the police did, um, you know, proceed along with, but they want to know why attempted murder wasn't part of it, and they have questions about if there were civil rights violated. Do you have answers from the police or anyone on, on those points? I know our police department has worked hard to review this situation, and while there are critiques, certainly we welcome those and further study. I think the challenge with a hate crimes charge is just the proof of intent that relates to it. What we do have is that there was a man who said that he was afraid of a black male outside of his door. He shot twice. The felony assault charge carries life in prison, which for an 84-year-old is a substantial potential sentence. There's an additional armed criminal action charge. Mm -hmm. But I believe that our federal investigators and so many others will look into this to see if there are further charges. I think what a lot of people, though, wanted to say over the last week is yeah. that this was taken seriously. It was astonishing to some that someone who could shoot someone twice was then back in their bed later that night. I know that we have worked hard to try to address that, but we'll answer or more questions as time goes along with this tragic situation. Just to button up what you were saying in terms of culture of fear, can't both things be true that there is too much anxiety and uh, manipulation of fear at the same time there is a legitimate concern about rising crime? You know, both can be true, but I don't think that's the actual situation now. I mean, think about the fact that, and you hear certain political figures who talk about cities that are fundamentally safer than actual cities in their own mm -hmm. state. Often this is kind of the Governor DeSantis bashing of New York City, which is much yeah. safer than a lot of the largest cities in the state of Florida. I right. think this is in many ways fully drummed up, and it's part of getting people more guns, getting them more afraid, okay. and I don't think it in any way relates to the data on the ground each day. Okay. Mr. Mayor, thank you for your time. We'll be right back. We turn now to Israel, where tens of thousands of protesters marched through Tel Aviv last night in opposition to the government's plans to overhaul the judicial system. This is just days ahead of Israel's 75th anniversary, celebrating its independence. For more, we go now to the country's prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. Good morning to you, Mr. Prime Minister. Good morning. Good to be with you. We're glad you are here. Um, you know, it has been a month since you hit pause on those judicial reforms. At this moment in time when you need national unity, why not withdraw them? Well, I, I think there's a, a broad consensus that we have to uh, make corrections in our judicial system. There's a, 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 obviously a dramatic difference between the views of how, to what extent, and so on. But I think this should not cloud the fact that we're celebrating here a modern miracle. Israel's 75th anniversary uh, is the change that happened to the Jewish people who were uh, decimated in the Holocaust. A third of our people were lost uh, to this independent nation that has become a power in the world. And I think everybody unites around that. You had to uh, cancel a Monday appearance at the largest gathering of North American Jewish leaders in years because of these protest concerns. Again, why not withdraw the proposal to overhaul the judicial system, which would give Parliament, which is controlled by your allies, authority to overturn Supreme Court decisions? Well, I've uh, actually uh, said that I will not accept a blanket uh, ability of the Parliament to overcome uh, judicial uh, Supreme Court decisions, just as we don't accept that the Supreme Court can abrogate any decision by the parliament or the government. Both sides, uh, both uh, of these uh, extremes actually 
uh, hinder the balance between the three branches of government, which is exactly what we're trying to uh, bring into balance now. No, there sir, is, sir, you're think, making this sound like it's uh, just a, a debate. And happy middle. You're making it sound like this is just a simple debate, like any uh, other country. But you yourself used the phrase that you were pausing because you wanted to stop the possibility of civil war. That was the phrase you used when you hit pause. I want to. I want to just uh, lay out for you here um, what it has done here in the United States. Um, those judicial plans led President Biden to say he won't be inviting you to Washington anytime soon. Listen. I'm very concerned. And I'm concerned that they get this straight. They cannot continue down this road. Hopefully, uh, the prime minister will act in a way that he can try to work out some genuine compromise. Biden told you to walk away. You seem to be betting yes. that there won't be consequences to alienating your closest ally. Well, I value the alliance with the United States, and I value the friendship I've had over 40 years with President Biden. I don't think anything will get in that way. But uh, it's, it's an internal matter that we have to resolve, and we're doing it. And the way we're doing it is by seeking a consensus. As we speak right now, Margaret, as we speak right now, there are teams of uh, my own party, the Likud and the coalition, with teams from the opposition speaking in the president's house. This is now the fifth or sixth meeting they've had, seeking that compromise that I think uh, is the mark of uh, democracies. You don't walk away from a problem. You try to solve it, but you no, try to solve away it from your through proposal. as broad a consensus as you can. Walk away from your proposal, which would well, allow parliament changed. with a simple majority we've, we've to override changed. any decision by the Supreme Court. That is your one check and balance on power, very different from the American system. I want to ask you about the makeup of your government, because it is impacting U.S. relations. Your finance minister calls himself a homophobe. He said a Palestinian village should be erased. You did say that was inappropriate. Your public security minister was rejected from army service because of past uh, ties to an extremist group designated by the U.S. as a terrorist organization. I know you need to keep your coalition together to prevent a collapse, but are you confident you can rein in people like this? I think a lot of them have changed over time, and they themselves say that. But the important thing to understand is they joined me. I didn't join them. We have by far the largest uh, party in the Knesset and certainly in the coalition. Uh, there are smaller parties. Uh, the mainstream policies are decided by me, uh, and that's what I'm doing. Well, this national security minister I just mentioned, Ben Gavir, who threatened to quit, which would have collapsed your government, you promised him a National Guard will be established under his control. The IDF and your security forces are more than strong. Um, he's already gone out and said he wants police to remove Palestinian flags from public spaces. What exactly do you think he's going to do with this National Guard? Well, the National Guard is not merely uh, his idea. It's a wide proposal, which is, by the way, recognized, was actually proposed by the previous government as well, because you need... Israel has uh, a small police force relative to the size of the population, and we face, unlike other police forces around the world, we face the constant threat of terror. There is a National Guard. It's going to be under one of our... Uh, national security, un, un, under one of our security arms, it's not going to be any individual persons or ministers, militia. That's not going to happen in Israel. Not okay. under me, and I suspect not under, under one else. It's just okay. not going to happen. Can you clarify this for us as well, because it's making headlines in the U.S.? Uh, politician May Golan said that you are considering appointing her to be consul general in New York. She calls herself a proud racist. She's denounced African refugees as Muslim infiltrators and criminals spreading HIV. Are you nominating her to actually serve in New York an incredibly important post for Israel? It is indeed an incredibly important post, and anyone I'll nominate, and I haven't done so, uh, will have to abide and will abide by the mainstream positions that I've advocated, and I've, uh, I welcome the, uh, the fact that the, the United States has uh, a multiracial uh, and pluralistic society. So does Israel. And as anyone I appoint will have to reflect the, uh, the value that I attach to that, uh, fee that quality uh, in our democracy and in yours. So you are not appointing her? I haven't, but uh, I'm telling you, you that won't. anyone that I will appoint will abide stringently, stringently by that view that I've uh, advocated throughout my lifetime. And it's not pro forma. It's not lip service. I really believe that. Okay. Um, sounds like 
you're saying she's not coming to New York. Um, I want to ask you about some of the Americans coming to Israel. Uh, Florida's governor, Ron DeSantis, is visiting Israel this week, and he's presumed to be running for president here, as you know. Do you plan to meet with him? Of course, I'll meet with everyone. Why not? I meet with Republican governors and Democratic governors. Uh, I'm not avoiding the question, and actually, I'm, I'm rushing right into it. I meet with every American representative, governor, senator, members of Congress, and I think it's, uh, it's my job. And I think it's important for Israel's bipartisan support in the United States. I make a point of it. Okay. Because for the first time, there was a poll from Gallup last month that showed Democrats are likelier to sympathize with Palestinians than with Israelis for the first time. Um, I know it's easy to dismiss polls, but this seems to be a reflection of public sentiment in the United States that relates directly to Israel's influence in America. 49% of Democrats sympathize with Palestinians, 38% with Israelis. Do you think that matters? Yeah, I do think it matters, and I think we have to work harder to persuade uh, our Democratic colleagues, uh, or those of those dem uh, our Democratic colleagues who, uh, uh, who forget, perhaps, that Israel is the, the solitary democracy in the Middle East, that America has no better friend and no better ally than Israel. But I'll tell you why I think this happens. First of all, it's happening over time. It happened over time. It's not related to this or that administration in Israel, because it happened. It continued under the previous government as well. I think there is a demonization of Israel uh, in uh, some of the reports, many of the reports that come out of here. And I think there is a portion of the American public that finds it hard to understand that once you, you enter the, the realm of nations, you have to act to defend yourself. And I think uh, we have to work hard to persuade uh, both Democrats. sides of the aisle and the independents in between, yes, both sides of the aisle, uh, and uh, in, in this case, Democrats, uh, because we have solid support among independents and solid support among Republicans and considerable support among Democrats, but I'm not going to give up. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. Until next week. For Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.